Well, once again, we're exploring the epistle to the Colossians, and whenever we probe into the Word of God, we do it with prayer. So let's bow our hearts. Father, again, we thank you for the opportunities you put before us. We thank you for your Word. We thank you for your presence. And we do ask you, Father, through your Holy Spirit, to open our hearts and lives to your Word, that we might have what you have here for us impact our lives as we commit this time and ourselves into your hands, indeed, in the name of Yeshua, our Lord, our Savior, our coming King, Jesus Christ, in whose name we do pray. Okay, we are in the Epistle to the Colossians, chapter 3, the first half of that chapter. And uh, in chapters 3 and 4, it's interesting, Paul's typical style is to establish a doctrinal foundation and then build the practical implications of that. That's exactly what he's done here. The first two chapters of this epistle were doctrinal. And now we're going to get into what you could call the practical session. Or as my friend uh, John Leffler always says, the so what section. So what does it all mean? What do we do? So what? What do I do with it? He always feels that if, if a message doesn't have answer to the question, so what do I do about it? It's useless. And so that's sort of what we have going on here in chapters 3 and 4. And uh, so they comp- 3 and 4 comprise, we're really st- when I say chapter uh, 3, after verse 4, the first few verses are still a bit of doctrine, but from that point on it's practical. And uh, is there any sense in which we are on probation? That's the question that is asked here. And if so, what are our responsibilities? You can't earn your salvation. That's all done by Jesus Christ. You can't either earn it or lose it once you have it. But okay, what's our response to that? Well, very, very significantly. So after his lengthy digression, the last part of uh, chapter 2, Paul returns now to apply the truth of verse 12. Buried with him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God, who hath raised him from the dead. So, uh, after all, it goes, excuse me, it does little good if Christians declare and defend the truth but fail to demonstrate it in their life. So you not only declare it and defend it, you need to demonstrate it. And that's the weak link for most of us. Talk's cheap, right? There are some Christians who will defend the truth at the drop of a hat, but their personal lives deny the doctrines they profess to, to, to love. And the people are tired of having extraordinary claims come from people who are living ordinary lives. And uh, so we must keep in mind that the pagan religions of Paul's day said little or nothing about personal morality. That was not a factor. In fact, if anything, immorality was encouraged. And so what a person believed had no effect on the relationship of how he behaved, and no one would condemn a person for his behavior. So in this outline then, we are moving from chapter 2, the doctrinal area, down to the first 17 verses of the last two chapters. Um, And uh, it's going to deal with personal purity on the one hand, Christian fellowship subsequently. After that, we'll get into the home, the workplace, and uh, related topics. Three instructions. First four verses. Seek the heavenly. Slay the earthly. Strengthen the Christly. Very skillfully, all start with S, so they must be true. (laughs) I don't know why I have that fixation. It happens in this particular series of materials that lends itself, but in general, I'm always, most of these alliterative things I feel are very contrived, but these seem to work okay. Seek the heavenly, slay the earthly, strengthen the Christly. So seek the heavenly. We died with Christ. Romans 6 through 8 hammers that thoroughly. That's your reference point. We live in Christ. Epistle of the Philippians amplifies that. We are raised with Christ. That's going to be in the first verse here. And we are hidden in Christ. That'll be in the third verse. And we are glorified in Christ in the fourth verse. Then from there we're going to go in verses 5 through 9 about slaying the earthly and then strengthening the Christly, if I can make that an adverb or whatever, uh, 10 through 11. So, if ye then be risen with Christ... And that's one of the reasons, by the way, I prefer the garden tomb as an idiom rather than the cross. That's where it's paid, but we, ra- we, we are risen with Christ. The cross didn't finish the story. It makes the story possible. 
But the good news, it was validated by the resurrection. And so we, we, li- we serve a living Christ. But if ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. And uh, again, if this is again a first class condition in the conditional, it uh, assumes the premise, the uh, protesis, for is, is true for the sake of argument with any mood or tense in the apodosis. So therefore, it's what we would say since, okay? There are four different classes that use argumentatively in the Greek, but this is the, the one that we would normally associate with here. And uh, seek those things. The, 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 the verb there, having an urgency and a desire and an ambition is what that is intended to portray. There should be an excitement that goes with seeking spiritual things. And that's one of the things you'll notice among many of our membership and people is their excitement. When Dan and I, uh, every time we might feel down, all we, all we have to do is read the mail from the members. They're so excited. And is that contagious? Is that contagious? Yes, to have a, uh, an excitement that goes with it. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. On things above. Think heaven. When I was in the, an executive, I, the, my IBM people gave me a little thing from the desk, you know, think. You know, it was, that was a, one of their trademarks. We ought to make some that looked like this. It says, think heaven, you know. Right. And uh, one of my friends gave me another one said, you know, uh, outthink. Don't just think, outthink. But anyway, but think heaven. Set your watch on HQ time, headquarter time. What time is it as far as he's concerned? It's interesting, Daniel did that, by the way. You may miss this when you study the book of Daniel. When he was a captive in Babylon, he would pray at the time of the evening oblation. In other words, there was no temple, there was no oblation, but it was the time of, as far as he was concerned, it was the time of evening oblation. So even though it was a couple of hundred miles to the east, He'd open his window and he'd pray, and it, it, it was a time for the evening oblation. And so, uh, so he was uh, uh, he reckoned his time to Jerusalem, which was a couple of hundred miles to the west. And uh, so, in politics, they say how you stand depends on where you sit, which side of the aisle, you know. Well, where are you seated? You're seated in the heavenlies. That should be your perspective. One of the things my wife and I have discovered, that's why we wrote the book, uh, The Kingdom, Power, and the Glory, is because we discovered some of the discoveries we think we've made about the, the Scripture has changed our day-to-day priorities. Because we suddenly realize what the kingdom, the kingdom isn't an abstract thing. It's our destiny. It's what we're being trained to go to. It's as if we're in boot camp. And if you're in boot camp... And you know at the end of your session there, you're going to be shipped to the front someplace. You take your training more seriously, you know. Well, that's where we are. We're in boot camp for heaven. In fact, not heaven as some kind of uh, conceptual abstraction. No, the kingdom from heaven that will be on the earth. That's why it's a genitive of of source, not a genitive of apposition in Matthew when he says kingdom of heaven. It's not a synonym for a kingdom of God. That's an all-embracive term. Within that, Matthew's being denotative 33 times. He speaks specifically. The kingdom from heaven. And uh, so it's on the earth. It has a capital. The floor plan of the, uh, the temple is laid out in, in Ezekiel in, in, in incredible detail and so forth. And so uh, once you start getting in, you suddenly realize, hey, it's coming and we're going to have an assignment there of some kind. And that assignment will be derived from our behavior now. Ooh, does that change priorities? And so uh, that's what we're trying to get at here. Think kingdom would be, when you say uh, 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 think heavenly, that's, that, that's his term from Ephesians, and that's fine. But it's, to me, more tangible to say think kingdom. Because there's a specific kingdom, and it's on the earth. It isn't some concept. In the book of Daniel, chapter 2, there are five kingdoms mentioned. Babylon, Persia, Greece, Rome in two phases. But fifth on a list of five is a kingdom that God is going to set up, destroying the others on the earth. It's a kingdom in that sense. Ooh, it has a king, it has subjects, it has a capital. So anyway, this is also a warning against false systems which attempt to rob you of the great unity with Christ in His death and resurrection. That's your unity. That's an organic union with a living Christ 
Don't let any of these weird side trips rob you of that. We, in Adam we were fallen, but in Christ we have received new life from Him, and therefore we're not to think of ourselves as in any sense on probation. Yes, we're being groomed. Yes, we're being sanctified, but that's not the same thing. You're not on probation. It's a done deal. You are in Christ. We do not stand before God on the ground of responsibility. If we did, we'd fail. There are very few mistakes I've missed. If it's up to me, I'll blow it. I'm grateful that I know in whom I believed and that He is able to keep that which I've committed unto Him against that day. So the responsible man utterly failed to keep his obligations. There was nothing for him but condemnation. But the Lord Jesus Christ has borne that condemnation. Romans 8, 1, there is therefore now no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus. Praise God. Are you in Christ Jesus? Then celebrate that. You betcha. Not on things on the earth. You know, it's interesting. Is the world cold, unforgiving, materialistic? The Scripture says that you become like that which you worship. If you worship the world, you will become cold, unforgiving, materialistic. That's why you want to worship Christ. Because you become like the things you worship. That's in several places in the Psalms. Things on earth. Anything, any alternative obsession is an idol. And I have to confess something to you. It may do my heart good to confess it publicly. For 30 years I was in the strategic arena. I was chairman and CEO of four different publicly traded defense contractors. I went to the Naval Academy when other people were in college. We were passing in review on Warden Field for whoever was visiting Washington that week. After my service career, I was in the intelligence community. I was in think tanks in the RAND environment. And then I was in the uh, defense establishment as a, in a, as a chief executive. 30 years in the strategic arena. I now look back. See, when we were in Boy Scouts, it was God and country. You didn't have to choose between them. But I now look back at the more recent years of that experience, and that which I used to consider patriotism, I now look at as idol worship. That's a painful admission on my part. It's hard for me to let go and realize that that's the way it is. And I could go on, but there's no need. You get the picture. Don't expect the world to understand us. Don't be surprised when you've ex experienced rejection. Cain hated Abel because his own works were unacceptable. The world in its heart of hearts knows that its works are unacceptable. They want to flee accountability. And if you're worshiping God, you're a threat to their own self-conceits. Don't expect them to embrace that. Even the Lord himself said, they hated me without a cause. He says that twice, actually. He said that in John 15, and he said it someplace else that may surprise you. Psalm 69 is one of the most quoted psalms in the New Testament because of some other parts of that psalm, but there is part of that psalm that describes his boyhood years in Nazareth when the drunks down the tavern made up dirty songs about he and his mother as, as if he was illegitimate. And it goes, it, it develops that in the middle part of that psalm. And that's where he also says there, they hated him without a cause. Even then, we know Christ suffered, but we overlooked the 30 years that he and his mother suffered Nazareth in a small town, in a culture which abhorred illegitimacy, as if they were, I'm, I was alien to my mother's children. Why not the father's children? Because they don't know who his father is. You know, and so on. You can unravel that if you want to get into it. But... Um, We've, we fail to realize the pain he must have suffered during those tender early years. He suffered the stigma of illegitimacy. Why? So that you and I could have clear title to be a son of God. Wow. 
Check out Psalm 69. You probably find it very provocative. Moving on, for Paul says, For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. What does he mean? Because you've died in Christ. You're on that cross 2,000 years ago. That's what Romans 6 through 8 will amplify for you. Now, he died for us. That was substitutionary. We have died with him in identification. That's what baptism is about, to identify with him. It's not the washing. It's the identity with him. Many people get that confused. He not only died for sin, bearing its penalty, he died unto sin, breaking its power. Sin no longer has power over you. Our link that bound us to the world and all its purposes has been severed. And we are freed from all necessity to be subject to sin in the flesh. And Romans 5 hammers that for you. If a lot of this is troublesome, I encourage you to get into a serious in-depth study of the book of Romans, the first seven chapters. Because chapter 8 is the dessert after going through the first seven. Ye are dead, it says. You know, there are two deaths. Second death, that speak, speaks of the second death. You realize there's two deaths? And the order of them is important, by the way. The first death is separation of the soul and the body. That's the def biblical definition of death. Separation of the soul from the body. The body will decay. The soul is, 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 is... The separation of the soul from God is the second death. And fortunately, you've got those reversed. Because our second death was taken care of at the cross. Which order is important? Those that are in Christ are not subject to the second death, the Scripture tells us. Huh? Your life is hid with Christ. You see, it's hid. Our, uh, our life is in His safekeeping. The whole issue of eternal security is directed at His the security of his keeping it for you. So he has it. Now the question is, is his, is his, his head is pretty high above? Has ever heard of a man drowning whose head was that high over the water? You know, that's a, a, a quip that seemed to fit. Anyway, nothing can separate us from the risen Christ. And anytime you have some doubts about that, you jump into Romans from chapter, chapter 8. I usually start about verse 28 and there following. And you cannot sit down, no matter how low you are, no matter how uh, uh, gloomy it might seem to you at that moment, sit down and read Romans 8 from verse 28 to the end of that chapter, and then I challenge you not to emerge with a comfort, a smile, and a confidence. It's the most exciting tour de force, uh, in my mind, in the epistles. Nothing can separate us from the love of Christ, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. See, the Christian life is a hidden life as far as the world is concerned. Because the world does not know Christ, they will not understand you. Don't be surprised if you find rejection. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. That confuses a lot of people. How can he come back to the earth in power with us? only because he gathered us earlier. Amazing how many people have trouble with the concept of the harpazo. Well, by the way, let's, let's be candid. That's the most preposterous doctrine in Christianity. The whole idea of the, the rapture or the harpazo. The only thing it has going for it is that it's unquestionably spelled out in the Scripture. And it may surpri surprise as many of my erstwhile uh, Scholars have discovered it's mentioned three times in the Old Testament. I should say it's hinted at three times. It's presumably revealed uniquely uh, in the... In, anyway. But the point is, uh, that unravels the whole picture. And of course, it's going to be the biggest shock the planet Earth's ever had. But uh, when Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. Wow. Devoutly to be wished, as Hamlet might say. For me to live as Christ, Paul says. And how can we appear uh, here with him but for a pre-trib rapture? And you can contrast that by going through 1 Thessalonians, on it goes. Okay. Well, this ends, it, this, this fourth verse of chapter 3 ends the doctrinal teaching. Here's where it really shifts into a, a practical thing. 
But the main point is Christ himself is the antidote to any error. And by the way, any time you have any kind of heresy, put Christ in the right in the middle of it and measure it by that. Let me give you another clue, a little surprise. How many of you reading your Bible come across a passage that confuses you or you don't understand? Anybody doesn't have his hand up, hasn't read his Bible. Obviously, okay. <laughs> now, let me give you a little trick. Let me, anytime you come to a passage in the Scripture that you don't understand, take out a journal just for that purpose, jot down the date, the time, the reference, and try to capture in ink, not in pencil, why it seems to you that that's confusing why it doesn't make sense, or why it seems to be self-contradictory, or whatever. Try to capture that feeling. Do it in a way that's private. You'll never show this to anybody else, so you can be totally candid with yourself, but put it in ink. Then what you do is go before the Lord with prayer. And say, Lord, you promised that your Holy Spirit would teach us all things. Not most things, all things. And I don't understand Hezekiah chapter 5, or whatever. I'm making that up. Um, Ask Him to reveal it to you. Remind Him of the promise to do that. Petition Him in the name of the Lord Jesus. And watch what happens. It won't necessarily be in the next 10 seconds. But something's going to happen. You'll be reading somewhere else and suddenly the light will go on. Oh, wow. Now I get it. It might be uh, someplace you're reading. It might be something you overhear on the radio or whatever. It might be a conversation you overhear in a restaurant. It might have nothing to do with this, but somehow something will be brought across your path that will unlock that concern. Then what I want you to do is go back to that journal. That's why you keep it. Find that page. Put down the date and how the Lord revealed to you what it really means and put the explanation in there. See, gee, that, Chuck, that sounds pretty good. Why all the paperwork? I'll tell you why. Because the day will come when you'll be going through the valley of doubt. There'll be times that it just you sometimes think maybe we've just gotten carried away with it all, et cetera, et cetera. I want you to take your journal and see the footprints of the Holy Spirit as He personally tutored you through your walk with Christ. Now, the other trick you can do as you do all that, when you have something you don't understand, put Christ right in the middle of it. You encounter some weird law in the Torah that makes no sense. Put Christ right in the middle of it and see what happens. And I could give you examples, but I'm already going to mess up my timing here, so let's always keep going. You get, the, you get the idea. What a gospel we have. It makes nothing of man and everything of Christ. Three instructions. Seek the heavenly. We died with Christ. We live in Christ. We are raised with Christ. We're hidden in Christ. We're glorified in Christ. Second, slay the earthly. That's where we're headed and strengthen the Christly. Paul's not going to focus on the practical holiness that derives from the first two chapters. More than declare and defend the truth, it is important to demonstrate it. Verses 5 through 11, it's going to, it relates to you and I ourselves. And verses 12 to 17, the rest of this session, will be our relationship with others. Ourselves first, then others. Notice the order. We must be right with ourselves before we can be right toward others. Colossians 3, 5, Mortify, therefore, your members which are upon the earth. Fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, the covetousness, which is idolatry, and he goes on. Mortify. The, the, the Greek uh, verb means put to death. Take them to the undertaker. Okay? We are to deal unsparingly with the sins of the flesh. We are to deal unsparingly with the deeds of the flesh. What are these deeds? Well, fornication. The word from which, uh, you know, uh, porn comes from, pornean. Sexual immorality in general, and that's a characteristic of our world, uh, as well as that of the Colossians. Uh, and when I preach 1st and 2nd Corinthians, I usually call it 1st and 2nd Californians. <laughs> the word Corinthian came to mean fornicator. And any analogy with Hollywood is intentional. Okay. Next one is uncleanness. 
What does that really mean? Lustful impurity connected with loose living. I'm sure you don't have any of those here in Britain. We'll move on here. Inordinate affection. Pathos is the Greek term, but it's inappropriate or excessive affection. It's appetites that seek opportunities to satisfy themselves. That's translated here, inordinate affection. And evil concupiscence. And uh, that's uh, base evil desires. Unlawful lusts and desires lead to deeds is the problem. But remember the secret here. To purify our actions, we must purify our minds and hearts. And the secret of this that my wife has taught so effectively is 2 Corinthians 10.5, taking every thought captive. Your thought life is the prelude that gives you the opportunity to take control. Take every thought captive before it can take root into an ambition and an action of some kind. Take every thought captive. What a marvelous, marvelous directive that is. If you don't know what I'm talking about, get her book, uh, The Way of Agape. And covetousness. Pleonexian. Putting things in the place of God. Worship of self is in that category. Which is, of course, idolatry. Covetousness is idolatry. All the way back to Exodus 20, verse 17, where God with his own finger wrote it in stone. No excuse can be offered on the ground of in innate tendencies of human nature. That's the argument of the homosexual. I think we should have some lobbying groups for the murderers and for the adulterers, and there's other sins that deserve representation before our parliamentary groups, not just homosexual. Why should, why should homosexual uh, behavior be singled out as being somehow above other inordinate desires? Well, it's in my nature. No kidding. But you know I'm a murderer? Sure, I remember. I, I have those thoughts. And I can go through a whole list. I won't shock you by going through the list, but you get the picture. For which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience. Ooh, ooh. What's this? For which things the what? Does God have wrath? Yes, he has. And he may have some surprising ones. The wrath of God. Let's take a look at a few of these. He has eternal wrath against sin, of course. I don't have to amplify that, but let's start with a broad brush right there. There is eschatological wrath. Eschatology is the end times. Eschatological wrath is the wrath that is unleashed at the, in the tribulation, right? It's detailed for you in Revelation 6 through 19 in very elaborate forms. That's the wrath, eschatological wrath of God. There's the calamitous wrath of God. Ask Noah about that. Genesis 6 through 9, the, the flood of Noah. God's wrath in the form of a calamity on the planet Earth. Unmistakable. Everybody there noticed it sooner or later. Hmm? There's consequential wrath. We reap what we sow, the Scripture says. And that's a form of enforcement that we should be conscious of. I'll call that consequential wrath. But here's one that most people miss that I wanted to highlight because it's so operative in our lives. I'll call it the abandonment wrath. And I'll look at four places. We'll look at Judges 16, Proverbs 1, Hosea 4, and Romans 1. Judges 16, 20 deals with Samson in his third visit to Delilah where she challenged him, the Philistines be on you, and he wakes up and realizes he no longer has his strength. Because she found out the secret, cut his hair, which wasn't the issue, it was, his, it was just a symbol of his commitment to God. But the point is, God abandoned him. Can you imagine Samson waking up and discovering that his traditional strength was gone? That, and he knew it was God's source, that God had abandoned him. Can you imagine the realization that God had abandoned him. Whew. Okay, there's another example, and that's the, the northern kingdom. After Solomon died, there was a civil war. The northern kingdom separated from the, the southern kingdom, and they were prosperous. Tremendous material prosperity, but they were, went into idol worship. 
And God sends Hosea up there to lay out his case that they're going to get destroyed. It isn't case, it's not a, it's not a message, repent or else it's going to happen. No, he's announcing through Hosea what's going to happen. And here's why. And he lays out the prosecutor's case from chapter 4 through chapter 14 of Hosea, lays it all. But here's the key verse. God says through Hosea, he says to Hosea, Ephraim, an idiom for the northern kingdom, is joined to idols. So leave him alone. God removes his hand of protection in the Northern Kingdom, and it's just a matter of time before Assyria wipes them out. They don't go into captivity like the Southern Kingdom to ultimately to return. No, they're obliterated as, as, as an entity. Ephraim is used 37 times in Hosea as an idiom for the whole Northern Kingdom. It's the synecdoche, as you call it, for the Northern Kingdom. It was the, it was the primary tribal constituent. And the parallels between Ephraim or the Northern Kingdom, and the United States is sobering, conspicuous, and relevant. And we develop that thoroughly in a number of our materials because it's, the parallel is so clear that it's really worth our study to understand that God does have, uh, 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 there, there's a parallel. Let him alone. God's wrath on the Northern Kingdom was abandonment. He allowed their enemies to just wipe them out. Let him alone has a painful note of finality. It's not a temporary thing. He washes his hands of the northern kingdom, in a sense. Okay. Proverbs 1, starting about verse 24. God says, Because I have called and ye refused, I have stretched out my hand and no man regarded. But ye have set at naught all my counsel and would none, and, and would none of my reproof. I also, God speaking, I also will laugh at your calamity. I will mock when your fear cometh. When your fear cometh as desolation and your destruction cometh as a whirlwind. When distress and anguish cometh on you, then shall ye call upon me, but I will not answer. Boy. They shall seek me early. The word is actually earnestly in the original. They will seek me earnestly. But they shall not find me. For they that hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord, they would have none of my counsel. They despised all my reproof. Therefore shall they eat of the fruit of their own way and be filled with their own devices. For the turning away of the simple shall slay them, and the prosperity of fools shall destroy them. Wow! Description of the abandonment and wrath of God in the book of Proverbs, chapter 1. Now the question I have, and I primarily direct this to the United States audiences, but you can decide yourself if it has broader relevance. Is there a national indicator that would confirm God's abandonment? You know, for years I've taught from 2 Chronicles 7.14, where God says, if my people who are called by my name if they'll do four things, I'll do three. If my people who are called by name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven, forgive their sin, and heal their land. And I've preached that for years as a call to repentance. I have to confess something to you, candidly. I'm not sure I can preach that anymore. I'm not sure I can preach that anymore. Because I suspect, I don't know this, I just suspect that we may be already under God's abandonment wrath. So the question I ask is, is there some kind of indicator, a national indicator that would confirm my position here? Am I premature? Or have we gone, have we crossed the line? Has he decided? Can I tell somehow? There is, I discover, a specific judgment of God that is so clearly identified. When I was doing additional research for an upgrade of our Genesis commentary some years ago, I was quite startled to discover that there is a jealousy of God that has priority over all, all the others. We always think of God as our Redeemer because our, from our New Testament perspective, and that's fair. And yet, as you study the Scripture, you discover that there's a, prior, there's a jealousy of God that preempts even that one. His number one identity that he's jealous of is his role as creator. 
I was quite startled to realize from Genesis 1 to Revelation 22, his role as the creator of the universe is first. It's first. And uh, there's a specific judgment pronounced by God in the scriptures for those cultures that fail to recognize him as creator. It starts in Romans chapter 1, starting at verse 18. I've, read, I've studied Romans many years, taught it many times, and from verse 18 to the end, I read many times thinking it meant one thing, and I suddenly realized, ooh, it means something quite more distinctive. Let's take a look at this passage and come to our own conclusions. Don't come to my conclusions, come to your own. But Paul writes, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven. So that's what we're talking about here in Romans 1. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Okay, so far. Because that which be, may be known of God is manifest in them. For God hath showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Notice this. We're talking creation, not redemption. You can't learn about the redemption from natural things, from the creation. That has to be revealed by the Holy Spirit to you. He's not talking about that. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen. What's he talking about? What, what invisible things are clearly seen? It's called design. The fact that we are in a designed environment. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead. So they are without excuse. Man is, has no excuse not to recognize that we are the results of skillful craftsmanship, not randomness. That's absurd. So we're without excuse. Let's see where he goes from here. Because that, when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. They chose darkness, in effect. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of an uncorruptible God into an image made like uncorruptible man and birds and four-footed feasts and creeping things. In other words, they chose idolatry instead. He's not finished yet. Wherefore, notice the next phrase, because of all of that, wherefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness. Notice that. God gave them up. God is judging them. I never appreciated what we're dealing here is a description of something God is doing, not what they're doing. Because their failure to acknowledge him, God says, uh, he says this three times in here. God says, God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lusts of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. That's a judgment of God who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. Again, here again, he, he goes into it. For this cause, God gave them up to what? What did he give them up to? Notice. Unto vile affections. For even their woman did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one toward another. Men with men, working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error which was meet or appropriate. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge... God gave them over, there it is again, to a reprobate mind, to do those things which are not convenient, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, 
not only do the same, get this, but have pleasure in them that do them. What does this mean? See, I always thought this passage from Romans 8, uh, 1, 18 to the end was about homosexuality. Not really. It's about a judgment of God. They don't acknowledge Him as a creator, which they're held accountable to without excuse. He will ultimately give them over to all this stuff. It's a judgment of God. Well, from that perspective, I realize that the sin of Sodom and Gomorrah, which led to their destruction, was not homosexuality. It was the public condoning of it. That's really what's going on in Genesis 19. As I look at America, and I see that every day it being reconfirmed that we are on the path of destruction. I reluctantly, at least tentatively, suspect that it's too late. Not too late for individuals to repent, don't misunderstand me. But I do not look to a national repentance. I hope I'm wrong. God in His sovereignty may give us a revival. I don't know if He will. But I do know that the focus is now on the individual, not the collective. For lots of other reasons too, by the way. So let's back, get back to Colossians. In the which ye also walked some time when ye lived in them. <laughs> Now, Paul now turns to what we might call social sins. I love what G. Campbell Morgan calls these. He calls these the sins in good standing, (laughs) the social sins. But now ye also put off all these, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. That's our pollution problem. Anger, that's cherished, begets wrath. Wrath, if not judged begets malice. Malice is an attitude of ill will toward another. Ephesians 4 deals with this. It says, let not the sun set on your wrath. Blasphemy. What is blasphemy? Strange word, isn't it? Blasphemy is slander, either Godward or, to, uh, or manward, if you will. It means to impute evil toward God or to seek to misrepresent Him or pervert the truth as to the Father, the Son, or the Spirit. It means to speak injuriously of one another, to circulate wicked and untruthful reports against one's brethren. And uh, it it seems so common, even among Christian newsletters or websites. It's astonishing to realize that it doesn't have to be untrue to be injurious. What's the most painful sin? It's gossip, a form of betrayal. We could spend a lot of time on that one. Filthy communication is just that, foul speech, coarse humor, obscene language. Some Christians think it is manly or contemporary to use this kind of speech. But if someone says to you, now take this with a grain of salt, you now can remind him of Colossians chapter 4, verse 6, which says, let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt. See, salt is a symbol of purity, of grace and, and purity go together. That's not the kind of salt that they think you're talking about, but that's what the salt that you should be lacing your conversation with. Verse 9 says, Lie not one to another, seeing that ye have put off the old man with his deeds. Lie not. Lying is one of the very first evidences of a carnal nature. The wicked are estranged from the womb. They go astray as soon as they be born, speaking lies. That's Psalm 58. A lie is a misrepresentation of truth, even if the words are accurate. It involves the intent to deceive. There are many entertainment elements that deal with things being accurate, but still misleading or untruthful in their spirit. When a Christian lies, he is cooperating with Satan, the father of lies, so designated by Jesus himself in John 8, verse 44. The Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth. John 14, John 15, and so on. Seeing that ye put off the old man with his deeds. Put off. These are terms of changing our garments. In the Greek, the grammar indicates it's once and for all. You do it once for, 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 for all. And... Uh, Habits, 
we have habits and garments are synonyms. Garments are like habits and habits are like garments. At his resurrection, Jesus left his grave clothes behind. Lazarus, when he was raised, he was dead. Jesus dallied to make sure he was, so to speak, the fourth day, and he stinketh, Martha reminds us. Well, he was dead, and he says, Lazarus, come forth. Why did he say, Lazarus, come forth? If he didn't call him by name, they all would have come forth. At least that's what we assume. So he was dead, but then he comes forth, and he's all entangled, bound up in his grave clothes. And so Jesus says, loose him and let him go. See, that's our problem. We're resurrected with Christ, but we don't get rid of our grave clothes. We carry the baggage that trammels us from success. See, initially he was dead. Then he was defeated until he got rid of his grave clothes. Once he did that, he was dangerous. In fact, so dangerous they had to plot to kill him. They couldn't have him walking around. John 12 talks about their plotting. And finally, then he's dining with the Lord. He was dead, then defeated, then dangerous, and then dining. You know that's true because it all starts with the D. So from, that would have seminary approval because it, it's alliterative. And I'm being facetious, of course. Three instructions. Seek the heavenly. That's the first four verses of this chapter. We died with Christ, we live in Christ, we are raised with Christ, we are hidden in Christ, we are glorified in Christ. And uh, the next verses 5 through 9, we should slay the earthly, and from 10 and 11, we should strengthen the Christly. Those are the three instructions that Paul gives us in this chapter. But verse 10, he says, and have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. Renewed. It's a present participle, which means it's continuous, indicating constantly being renewed. This is not the aorist or the past tense or what perfect. It is the present, continuing. And uh, this is really echoes Romans 12, the first two verses. Be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. If you want to understand how to do that practically, uh, I, I call your attention to Nan, my wife's, the second book of her trilogy called Be Ye Transformed, a very practical, proven handbook for those that want to deal with that with respect to their personal law. All this is the opposite of legalism. It's the spontaneous expression of the life of the head in the members here on earth. Um, and put on the new man which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. Man was created in the image of God. That's Genesis 1. When man sinned, this image of God was marred and ruined. Adam's children were born in the image of their father. In spite of the ravages of sin, man still bears the image of God. We were formed in God's image and deformed from God's image by sin. But through Jesus Christ, we can be transformed into God's image. We must be renewed in the spirit of our minds, according to Ephesians 4, and so on. As we grow in the knowledge of the Word of God, we, can, we will be transformed by the Spirit of God to share in the glorious image of God. God transformed us by the renewing of our minds. That's the very terms used in Romans 12. And this involves the study of God's Word and is the truth that sets us free from the old life, as Jesus points out in John 8. God's purpose for us is that we be conformed to the image of His Son. That's one of the primary purposes. That's in Romans 8, again, verse 29. Just the verse right after my favorite, which is 28. The favorite, Romans 8, 28. For we, for we know that all things work together for good to them are, that love God. To them are the called according to His purpose. The most three most important words in that verse are the first three. And we know. We don't believe or hope. No, no. We know that all things work together for good. For everybody, no. For them that love God, who them, to them who are the called according to His purpose. That's who He's talking about. You want to make sure you're one of those. Let's continue Colossians verse, chapter 3, verse 11. Speaking, where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond or free, but Christ is all and in all. Now, a barbarian, by the way, in the terms here, a barbarian was a term for people who didn't speak Greek. It comes to mean something quite different to us, but it, it's barbarian in a broader sense. But the ultimate bar barbarian in their mind was the Scythian. The Scythian was the ultimate barbarian. They were, it's a very colorful culture to study. A nomadic culture, um, very uh, um, 
We, we know a lot about them through Russian archaeologists and so forth. It's very worth understanding. See, Greeks regarded all non-Greeks as barbarians, but the Scythian was pro it, proverbially the worst. And you need to understand something kind of interesting. The Scythian lived north beyond the Caspian and Black Sea. And that's a place called the Caucasus. And you may not realize it, but you're probably, many of you here are designated on your passports or certificates that you're Caucasian. <laughs> How many of you are listed as Caucasians here? Did you realize that those are Scythians? You guys are to be feared, man. <laughs> See, all distinctions like this, of course, are irrelevant. National, religious, ministries that are built upon human distinctions such as race, color, or social standing are not biblical. Not biblical for this verse, if, not the, if none other. Circumcision, that means you're Jewish or non-Jewish is, is, is what I intend to hear. And in Galatians 6, Paul says, For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision availeth anything nor uncircumcision, but a new creature. And as many as walk according to this rule, peace be on them and mercy and upon the Israel of God. And don't think that Israel of God doesn't mean national Israel. Many people try to build a monument out of this verse saying, oh, Israel of God is idiomatic of the church. Big mistake. Not true. Not true. Don't confuse the church and Israel. That's one of the biggest mistakes that most people make if, they don't, if they're not careful. It turns out if you understand the Greek carefully, this actually, the, the Israel of God in Galatians 6, 16 refers to national Israel. If you understand the Greek and the use of the chi there and the rest, and Arnold Fruchterbaum has a whole book on that very specific thing. And so we don't have to build that here, just be aware of it. Pursuit of holiness. The first, verses 5 through 11, relates to ourselves, but verses 12 through 17, our relationship with others. That's where we're shifting here. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies and kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, and long suffering. Wow. The elect of God. Did you know you're the elect of God? Who chose you? Did you choose him or did, you, did he choose you? Right? Those whom he has foreknown from outside time, that is in eternity, and who are manifest in time as a believer in his son. Well, now that's, a, that's the classic debate, isn't it? Predestination versus free will. If it's predestined, then I don't have a choice. No, you do have a choice. Well, you said I was predestined. Yeah, God knows what choice you're going to make. You see, it's a paradox only when viewed from within the time domain. If you stand outside time, it's very simple. Yes, you have free choice, but God can't learn. He knows what choice you're ultimately going to make. Are you chosen of God? Absolutely. When were you chosen? Before the foundation of the world. Can you realize that you were chosen before the foundation of the world? Lots of verses, but Ephesians 1, 4 is the classic one. See, there's a chain of five links you want to be aware of. See, God's sovereign purpose is exemplified in two verses. Again, we're in Romans 8, verse 29 and 30. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Now, by the way, Sp Spurgeon apparently is one of the first to equip this. He says, I'm glad he chose me uh, before I was born. I'm glad he did because uh, he might have changed his mind now. <laughs> But uncertainty, by the way, get this though, uncertainty about election can cause, uh, be, uh, can arise some kind of self-righteousness. See, you didn't have anything to do with it. He chose you. Okay. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. Whom he called, them he also justified. Whom he justified, them he also glorified. That's the steps. The eternal choice and foreknowledge involves more than establishing a relationship between God and believers. It involves the certainty of our sanctification. Many people miss that. And uh, those that God foreknew, He also predestined to be conformed to the likeness of His Son. There's a chain of five links. To foreknow, whom He foreknew, He predestinated. Whom He predestinated, them He called. Whom He called, them He justified. Whom He justified, them He glorified. So there, those are the five links. Foreknow, that's a manifestation of God's knowledge. Predestination. That's, you've got Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob here. Abraham was predestined. In Isaac, his seed is called. And that's in Genesis 21, Hebrews 11, and Romans 9 develops that idea. Out of Isaac, of course, comes Jacob. 
If God can justify Jacob, there's hope for all of us. Would you buy a used car from Jacob? <laughs> I don't think so. And then comes Joseph, whom he glorified. The process starts with foreknowledge. The entire group is brought into God's eternal plan by his divine foreknowledge and his choice is predestined. That's what we mean by predetermined. In whom he obtained an inheritance, Ephesians tells us, being predestined according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. Okay. So that gets to predestined. Simply planned in advance is all that means. Ephesians 1 deals with that, of course. According as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved. So that leads to the call, an efficacious call to come to him. In John 10, we looked at that before, and of course in Romans 1, 6 and so forth. And uh, that leads to justifying. Justification simply means declared righteous. And obviously that's well documented. And, uh, and to, to glorify those he also glorified. And that, that's all the way through. So those, those are the steps. And this is amazing because this is a clear statement of the eternal security of the saints. Far beyond just justification. All the way. So we have foreknowledge which leads to election, election to predestination. Foreknowledge determines election. Predestination brings to pass the election. Election looks back to foreknowledge. Predestination looks forward to destiny. That's the steps. And it's only a paradox when you view it from within the time domain. You've got to step out, step out of the box to get the whole picture. So there's corporate election. Israel, the church are both corporate elections, different, different origins, different destinies. Individual, same thing, according to the foreknowledge of God we just looked at. Holy of grace, not of human merit. You didn't earn it. God chose you. To, whereby certain are chosen for himself for, or for distinctive service. Okay. Predestination has to do with God's purpose with his people. It refers only to those who are saved. Election refers to the people of God. Predestination, the purposes of God. There's a subtlety there. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering. Holy and beloved. All it means is set apart. Those who have been set apart in Christ, sanctified by the blood of the everlasting covenant, dear to God because they are His own children, partakers of the divine nature. That's you, I trust. Bowels of mercy. Now, that's a strange term in our vocabulary. We think of heart. Boy, that guy has a lot of heart. Well, the, the older view was uh, he had a lot of guts. <laughs> okay. And uh, just to express the deepest feelings, stirred with deep compassion. And we need to express our tender feelings with compassion to one another more often. Mercies, kindness, those are our inner vestments. David's treatment of Meshivabeth is, is one, of the, uh, one of the examples that's used from the Old Testament. Humbleness of mind. See, the next is a cap for the head. Humbleness of mind. Pride is a stench in God's nostrils. It's through pride that sin was first introduced into the universe through Lucifer. Leaven is a type of sin because it corrupts by puffing up. Interesting idiom. Humbleness of mind is not thinking poorly of yourself. It's having the proper estimate of oneself in the will of God. Big difference. Very important. And of course, meekness. That's in contrast with the psychotherapy's pursuit of self-esteem. We're to take on a vesture of meekness. Now, meekness is not weakness. It's power under control, like a soothing wind or like a healing medicine or a broken cold. It's composed of, rare, of rarer material than most suppose. Moses also was meek, the Scripture tells us. And we're told to seek meekness. Jesus is the model. And I know of no other source than God's presence, and we need to constantly seek it. Long-suffering, long-tempered is what it really says. Readiness to endure grief, suffering wrongfully. It's natural for us, when falsely accused, to feel we must defend ourselves or resent such treatment. When King Hezekiah 
and his officers were taunted by their adversary, charging them falsely and threatening severe treatment, the king's command was, answer them not a word. Answer them not a word. What a defense. God can be depended upon to vindicate his own if they do not attempt to vindicate themselves. Jesus is praying for those who despitefully use them and who persecute them in Matthew 5, the Sermon on the Mount. Again, Jesus is the model. Forbearing one another, literally holding up is what it really means, uh, one another. Forgiving one another. Forgiveness opens the heart to the fullness of the lo love of God. In part. And uh, how much and how frequently has God forgiven you? Oh boy. Remember the Christian's bar of soap. 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, He is faithful. Not us. He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We call that the Christian's bar of soap. 1 John 1, 9. Use it frequently. But you need to ask one for forgiveness. You don't say, gee, you're sorry. It needs to be a two-party transaction. You ask, the other forgives. And if you fail to forgive, you're binding yourself to that issue. You forgive him because that frees you from that issue. Otherwise, you'll be in bondage to it. And that leads to a root of bitterness, which is destructive. Above all these things, put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness or completion. In the clothing of spiritual warfare, we need a white belt, not a black one. Huh? The pinnacle of gifts, agape. Love is the first fruit of the Spirit. Others will follow, as we'll see in the next verse. The biggest shortage in the body of Christ is love. Is love. Mahatma Gandhi was asked, what is the biggest obstacle to Christianity in India? He had an interesting answer. Christians. <laughs> interesting. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which also ye are called in one body, and be ye thankful. The word rule there is an athletic term, which is, uh, it means to preside at games and distribute the prizes. You and I, the term uh, umpire comes close from our point of view. Um, they, they're the ones that rejected the contestants that were not qualified and disqualified those who broke the rules and so on. And be ye thankful. Boy, how much do we have to be thankful for? I personally believe the two sins that I personally deal with continually in my prayers is my ingratitude and my presumption. Those two categories capture so much of that which and can trammel us from where we should be. Boy, how much we have to be thankful for. One of our most common sins is ingratitude, and we should keep that constantly in mind. We should be thankful always for all things, and Ephesians 5, of course, hammers that home too. Let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Well, I have to confess, that's not, I'm not very good at that. I couldn't, the only notes I can carry have to be well collateralized. Right? Let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly. The Word of Christ, this is the only place that phrase occurs. Only here. Does the Word dwell in you is the question. And it also indicates songs are important. I don't happen to have those skills, but I regret that I don't. Our lives are to be lyrical and filled with the melody of Him. The joy of the Lord is your strength, Nehemiah suggests. You know, it's interesting, um, uh, it's, it's sort of sobering actually to compare the richness of the theology of the classic hymns with the rather vapid lyrics of much of the Christian music today. It astonishes me to really appreciate the theology in some of the great old hymns. And uh, the, uh, uh, in contrast to what people call the 7-Eleven music. Seven words repeated 11 times, you know. <laughs> and uh, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. The hymn should be addressed to Him from our hearts, not our lips. This is parallel to Ephesians 5, similar passage. So there is a danger today, as there was in Paul's day, that local churches minimize the Word of God. 
This church here is one of the refreshing exceptions. But I think most of you are aware enough to realize how unique this exception is. And there are, uh, there are across America, we, we visit a lot of churches, but the ones that are committed to the Word of God are a small minority. Everybody else is chasing amusement, entertainment, and, and uh, in their own way, the world. Nope, we need to maximize our commitment to the Word of God, and God takes care of the rest of it. There is, according to Paul, a definite relationship between our knowledge of the Bible and our expression of worship in song. Some of the reason these songs are so vapid is because the singers are uh, devoid of real roots in the Word of God. One way we can teach and encourage ourselves and others is through the singing of the Word of God, but if we do not know the Bible and understand it, we can't honestly sing it from our hearts. We can mimic catchy tunes, but we're not reaching into the meat. This poverty of Scripture in our churches is one cause of the abundance of unbiblical songs that we have today. Some of them are scary, you know. I won't start that down that path. Let's go on here. Whatsoever you do, and oh, this is this is the this is you want another memory verse. We had about three of them so far. This is a dandy. Colossians three seventeen. Whatsoever ye do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. Boy, is that a broad sweep. Is that a broad sweep? Whatsoever you do, whatever it is, when you go shopping, whatever you're doing, take the most menial, the most common activity, take God with you. Whatsoever you do, in word or deed, do all in the name of Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. This summarizes it all. In the name of the Lord Jesus. You know, it's interesting, names were assigned to reflect our character. When Abraham and Sarai, when Abram was changed to Abraham and Sarai to Sarah, all God did is put a he in the name, an H, what we call an H, a he in the Hebrew. And the he represents a breath, a wind, the ruach, the spirit. He put the Spirit of God in both of them. And their names were changed because they had the Spirit of God in them. Interesting. I'm sparing you the whole long story, but anyway. Jacob was changed to Israel. Simon to Peter. Saul to Paul. Those names are each very relevant. Our entire life, every detail is to be put in subjection to the Lord. This is the ultimate test of appropriateness and conduct and so forth. Now, always a can I do such and so? Can you do such and so in the name of the Lord Jesus giving thanks? If your answer is yes, do it. If the answer is no, don't. Can I do such and such? Well, can you do it in the name of the Lord Jesus giving thanks? Well, I don't know. Well, I don't think, I don't know if you should do it. So that's your yardstick. That's your litmus test. It's pretty simple. Keep it in mind. Apply it. There's no room for self-will or self-assertiveness. He does not want to be number one on a list of ten. He wants to be number one on a list of one. That's what it's all about. Even the Lord of the universe came not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. That was Jesus' attitude. He didn't do what he wanted. He did what his father wanted him to do. And there is a theological argument that everything he did, he did by the power of the Spirit. He didn't do it as the power of the Son of God. That's what that first temptation was about, where Satan says, you know, turn these, bre- turn this into, turn this, these rocks and these stones into bread. He could do it, but no, he's doing everything by the Holy Spirit. Ooh, that's interesting. Comparing the Ephesians passage with this one, we are to be filled with the Spirit as well as being filled with His Word. And if He represents the Godhead, then they're both synonymous, aren't they? Giving thanks. That's the fifth of six references to thanks in this letter. And what's really interesting as you get these admonitions from Paul, realize he's writing as a prisoner. I always feel I can hear the clank of the chains as he's writing. He was a prisoner encouraging us. Four motivations. We forgive because Christ forgave us. The peace of Christ should rule in our hearts. 
The word of Christ should dwell in us richly, and the name of Christ should be in our identification and our authority. Christ is all in all, and that's verse 13, 15, 16 of this series here. Okay. So we've been through this outline. We have taken a, a look at the first half of chapter 3. The next session would, uh, will take care of uh, the, next, the rest of chapter 3. And so I want you to study the rest of chapter 3, including the first verse of chapter 4 as part of that. And uh, why is the government the predictable purveyor of immorality? Many people don't realize their government has an incentive to promote immorality. That may shock you. Why? And we'll develop that next time. Why will many Christians be disappointed when they get to heaven? That's just a personal assertion. But why am I making that? Am I right or am I wrong? Let's check that out. And why was Paul so fearful of, in his words, being a castaway? Was he afraid of losing his salvation? I thought he wrote the book on eternal security. What's he talking about? Lest I preach to others that I myself might be a castaway. We'll take up those things in the next session. Let's stand for a closing word of prayer. And bar our hearts. Father, we thank you for your word. We do pray, Father, that through your Holy Spirit that you would help us appropriate these doctrines into duty, that we might be more effectual at pleasing you by applying these truths that you've revealed to us through your word that we each might be more pleasing in thy sight, that we each might be more effective stewards of these graces and opportunities that you afford us. We do pray, Father, that through your Spirit and through your Word, we can be more pleasing in your sight. O oh Lord, our strength, our Redeemer, our coming King. For it is in the name of Yeshua that we do indeed pray these things. Amen. Amen.